one thing I want to talk about, you know, before we, you know, get hands on here is the African American um, influence, and it's something I've been really getting into lately. And um, you know, when you base, if you're going to just really simplify things, you have these Scots Irish Celtic tunes coming over here, and then encountering African rhythms. And also you have Africans coming over here being asked to play new instruments and these new tunes. And what they did with that is just beautiful stuff, you know. And, you know, when you think about it, so many of the guys that I knew, there's not a top influential country. When I say country, I mean the whole Big Ten, everything from old-time fiddling to, you know, honky-tonk, right? Musician that did not have some African-American major mentor. I mean, Hank Williams had a street musician named T. Tot. Uh, A.P. Carter went around with a guy named Leslie Riddle, who was like a human tape recorder before there were tape recorders. Um, uh, Bill Monroe, Arnold Schultz was a, a black musician in Kentucky who not only influenced Monroe, but he was a big influence on Merle Travis and Ike Everly. Well, Ike Everly's the dad of the Everly brothers, who were the heroes of two guys from Liverpool when they started working out the harmonies <laughs> running in the party. Now, all this stuff's connected, you know, and I think it's, it's really cool, but all this goes back, you know, and Tommy Gerald learned tunes from black musicians, and you think about this happening in the heart of Jim Crow South. The musicians were way ahead of the curve because music was more important than all that other crap. And I don't know, that's just... So I'll play a couple African American things. This comes from uh, Gribble Luskin York, okay? They were a black string band from East Tennessee, uh, and they were recorded in the 40s. Now, the name of this is Sambo, and for a lot of us, that's got, you know, kind of troublesome uh, connotations. connotations. But I did this tune in a thing on black, uh, you know, African influence in Appalachian music with a guy from Senegambia who plays... The Akanting, which is the ancestor of the banjo, right? He goes, what do you call that tune? I said, Sambo. He goes, Sambo, that is the most common last name in my country. He goes, wow. it is like Smith or Jones in America. Wow. The vernacular is, they get some slave, what's your name? Sambo. Oh, so that's Smith. Not what, that's, yeah. well, and that's how that got around. Now, I never would have known that, except <laughs> that, you know. So anyway, they played this tune, Sambo, all right? <laughs> Eastern Maryland, I believe, okay? And the funny thing is the way everybody tried to figure out what the title of the tune was. So at first, from the recording, Mike told us it was titled Sally Gal, which sounded kind of weird. And then we figured out, and that's what we called it on the record, but then we, somebody said, well, actually, no, what he's saying is called Tie Your Dog Sally Gal, Tie Dog Sally Gal. But then the newest thing, which makes the most sense, because after I've heard it, is he's going, it's titled Sally Gal. So oh, yeah. it's titled Sally Gal. Title Sally Gal. And they go, okay? <laughs> All right. So anyway, there's a little, okay? So that's it. Whatever you want to call it, that's what it is. Uh, that's the way a lot of people do it. I guess there's other ways of doing it, but that's my way. Do you end up singing or whistling? 
whistling the tune while you're in the process of learning? Yeah, you know, if you, to me, if, if you can't hum a tune, how are you going to figure out how to yeah. fiddle it? Okay. After you hum it, though, that's when you start finding all the nuance. All the little rhythmic and, and yeah. melodic and harmonic things that make it sound so good that you wanted to learn it. Right? right. I mean, you know, like, let's... Uh, Let's see, there was one more. Okay, I want to show you one more thing on this African-American thing, and then I'll use that as a segue to get you all picking up some fills. How's that? All right? Okay, so I had learned this version of this tune called Midnight by a guy who knew a black fiddler named Jim Booker from Kentucky, who was a very influential fiddler. I did not realize when I was first learning the fiddle, and I had these old records of Taylor's Kentucky Boys playing Gray Eagle in the version I learned, that... They had a black fiddler in that. Now, you, again, you know, in our world, so what? You've got to understand that in that world, this stuff was not happening in any other domain except music. You know? And I think that that's significant. You know? But anyway, Jim Booker, he... And, and I'll tell you what, there some of the old musicians that I knew right in Rockbridge County here learned a lot of music from African-American musicians who lived in the mountain regions of this county and played, you know, what we would call white Appalachian music. It was their music too, you know. Then they'd go into town and they'd play gospel and blues. They knew it both, but they, you know, everybody in those generations, the more and more I inquired about it, the more I found this was universal, okay? So I had learned Jim Booker's version of this tune, Midnight, which is very jazzy, okay? And then I heard the more... Scots Irish version that had preceded it. So I'll play you a little bit of both these. I've just been fooling with this recently, okay? Yeah. So it's called Midnight. Here's the old version of it. so long to figure out what the heck he was doing on this. It's so weird because it starts off with this little tag that repeats and it takes you a while to realize that's a tag. You'll see what I mean after I play it. This little tag. He took that part that was in the other tune and kind of set it apart rhythmically. I don't know, it's pretty brilliant when you really, you can't, like, I can't communicate this in just a short thing like this, but if we had time to sit down and listen to the both two things, you see how cool it is. for anybody that wants to play old time fiddle is one listen 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 that is the thing like what I do when I'm going to learn to I just listen to that tune endlessly till it's permeating my consciousness 
and then I try and figure out how to play it, and then I go back and I listen to it and I hear everything I'm doing wrong. Like, why? He's getting that. I'm, how, I'm, how come I'm not that stuff's in there? I, I love seeing people keep that and finding new ways of using it. So that's just my own thing. Because basically most people nowadays want to play just kick butt, break down stuff, right? But if you've got these little things in it, you can make nice little variations in it. Um, what are some tunes that some of you all are working on that you'd like, like to have, you know, it, it would help seeing somebody else do it? I was told to make this hands-on, so I'm trying, but I don't know how many hands of ma how many different. Yes, yeah, sir. Bachelor's Hall. Bachelor's Hall. You know what? I've heard that, and it's a beautiful tune, uh, but I don't know it. Where did you hear it from? It was John Carson. Okay. Wow. Well, I might get you to show me later. So I John Henry is. John Henry. Okay. It's just a great. All right, now John Henry, there's so many different versions of it, and um, you know, in Kentucky, they use the four chord in it, uh, you know, when you're playing it on the guitar. Um, I know the Tommy Gerald's version of it mostly, okay, and so that's what I'll play for you. And it's in A, cross key A, yeah. And you know, uh, banjo players love it too, it's a great banjo tune, and that's one of the things is like, um, Mount Airy fiddling, or round peak fiddling, right, to me is the apogee of the fiddle banjo duet. And the way the fiddle plays with that is to work with the banjo, and the way the banjo, you know, it, all those guys played both fiddle and banjo. And so it just works so great together. And so again, you know, the focus of the fiddling is to make things work with fiddle banjo duet. Something like what I just played a minute ago, that big hoedown, that's solo fiddle stuff. By the time you add a guitar, and even later a bass, you know, things change. Um, just look at it this way. In 1870, a fiddler's probably playing solo for a dance. By 1880s, they're playing fiddle and banjo. No matter what part of the mountains I talk to people from, these that old generation, you know, that was born in the 1890s, early 1900s, they said the guitar didn't come in until after World War I. Once the guitar comes in, you have to decide what the chord is whether it's major or minor, for example, on a lot of those modal tunes. And the fiddler has to change things. Every instrument that gets added, the fiddler takes away some of all those ornaments we're talking about. So you find the most of those old Celtic ornaments in that West Virginia fiddling where they didn't do so much fiddle banjo stuff. Okay? But, you know, with something like John Henry, it's made to be in that round peak fiddle banjo duet thing. And so it, that's the way it's, it works.
the bow, and that's a little different. It's, uh, you know, it's a little bit more defined melodically and, and stuff. Uh, what I'm going to do here is just show you a few of these little regional things, then see something that you all would like to concentrate on, and we'll pick a tune and see what we can what we can do with it, okay? Um, and uh, I'll show you some things in standard, too, in case some of you don't want to tune up. Uh, let me see here. Let the other one. No, I started thinking too much about what I wanted to tell you about this. This is a really old tune. This is Eden Hammonds, who was recorded in the 40s when he was in his late 80s. So this is 19th century fiddle style, okay? This is a tune called Big Hoedown. Let me focus on it a little bit. You hear it? Because, again, it's got a bunch of the stuff that you don't use every day in contemporary old-time fiddling, but you learn these things, they're in your toolbox, and you can bring them out in places where they fit, you know? So, let me try this again. things are not so much in force anymore, but going back and listening to the old stuff and hearing these things and then get them in your toolbox, you know. All right, so I'm in cross key A here, right, which is pretty commonly used all over the mountains for a lot of A tunes. Not just because it makes some fingering easier, but because before the banjo, came in, right? There's a general thing that you, it varied dependent on the region, but in general, okay, there was a, for a long time, fiddlers played dances alone. And so if you're hitting a string, right, that's still ringing while I go over and play the other things. If I'm playing a note, as soon as I take my finger off, it stops ringing. So having those open strings and using those drones, if you're being a solo fiddler for a dance, keeps that that going it, and you can use it rhythmically as well as harmonically okay um, and it's pretty simple you know all right I'll play a couple of tunes from a couple of different regions uh, in this tuning and just see the little things that you can hear it's there I'll start off with Tom and Gerald's old bunch of keys which is you talk about Boeing this is there's not much to it on the left hand, it's all bowing, right? Which makes sense, because look, this was dance fiddling, and the bowing goes along with the dance steps. It's a percussive thing that goes along with the rhythms and the little uh, variations that dancers would make with their feet, right? Here's somebody. You know, the, the bowing kind of matches that. Uh, Tommy Gerald was the last 
you know, of the Appalachian fiddlers I can think of that used the old Scottish and he used it a little less as he as he got older. If you listen to his recordings, the earlier recordings, he uses tons of them. By the end, he, he kind of was not using them so much. But what I'm talking about that is that little... You know, Scottish and fiddlers use a lot. They do you generally do a little quicker. It's just a little thing. That's almost completely disappeared from American fiddling. But I love it, and so I use it. And I'll take it and I'll put it in other tunes if it fits. You know, rhythmically. What's your name? James Leva. James Leva. Okay. Well, okay, in old time fiddling pretty universally, okay? The uh, you know, down bowing on the downstroke is just like rule number one. And like any other rule, like Albert Hash from White Top, he up bowed, you know, actually the great filler, exception to the rule. But ninety nine percent of them you know, that's your main thing. And if you keep that groove going with the down bow, then there's all kinds of other little stuff that goes on to some of that if you want. Like I could just show you, for example, again, these regional things are not so much in force anymore. But going back and listening to the old stuff and hearing these things, and then get them in your toolbox, you know. All right, so I'm in cross key A here, right? Which is pretty commonly used all over the mountains for a lot of A tunes. Not just because it makes some fingering easier, but because before the banjo came in, right, there's a general thing that you, it varied dependent on the region, but in general, okay, there was a, for a long time fiddlers played dances alone. And so if you're hitting a string, right, that's still ringing while I go over and play the other things. If I'm playing a note, as soon as I take my finger off, it stops ringing. So having those open strings and using those drones, if you're being a solo fiddler for a dance, keeps that that going. It, and you can use it rhythmically as well as harmonically, okay? Um, and it's pretty simple, you know? All right, I'll play a couple of tunes from a couple of different regions uh, in this tuning and just see the little things that you can hear it's there. I'll start off with Tommy Gerald's old bunch of keys, which is, you talk about bowing, <laughs> this is, there's not much to it on the left hand, it's all bowing, right? Which makes sense, because look, this was dance fiddling, and the bowing goes along with the dance steps. It's a percussive thing that goes along with the rhythms and the little uh, variations that dancers would make with their feet, right? Here's somebody. You know, the, the bowing kind of matches that. Uh, Tommy Gerald was the last, you know, of the Appalachian fiddlers I can think of that used the old Scottish bow, which is pretty simple but forces you to do groove. All right? Look, if you're playing a dance and you mess up a note, people will wince. If you're playing a dance and you screw up the rhythm, they will throw stuff at you. Okay? You've got to keep the groove. That's what old time fiddling is. It's the groove, okay? That John Ashby version of Gray Eagle simplifies it to just a groove, you know, cycle, okay? So here in Cross Key, I'll play you a little bit of the Taylor's Kentucky Boys version, more or less the way I remember it. Um, you know, the standard way of playing Gray Eagle in Cross Key, all right? Thank you. 
and standard and I, <laughs> the notes are different there. But again, what happens is if you've got it in open, those notes keep ringing and you'll see when I play it in standard, as soon as you take your finger off, they quit. But it's basically the same tune, right? Right? And then the low part is... Okay? Now, if you take it in standard, which is where John Ashby, who was uh, from the northern Blue Ridge area, uh, like up around, I don't know, like up towards Paris, Front Royal Paris, Warranty. Warranty. Yeah, like an area that, you know, is like hardly Virginia anymore, but it was. Um, so what he did with it, instead of going, he just did Now I'm switching over to standard. And then sometimes he goes and takes that high part and puts it on the low strings. This part there was. Right? And he goes. up here. Alright? Okay, so what I can show you is what I do with it nowadays is I blend the two versions together. Okay, so if you want to play the notey version, here's what it is. And so it's got a different lilt to it, right? Da 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 da, -da right? Whereas Ashby's version just gets like right to it, you know? guitar player can play the exact same thing but what you're doing is you know changing the groove a little bit okay and then the low part is almost the same except on the on the Kentucky version you go uh, go back up there at the end and Ashby doesn't do that he just stays low but I mean, again, quarterly, you know, it stays, it's the same, and then rhythmically it's the same. So do you all want to try that tune? I mean, I was told to make sure you all walked out of here with something. <laughs> so, this way, you can either play it in cross key A or in standard, whichever you prefer, okay? But you're going to, you know, you'll end up with different things, slightly, on the low part, yet the high part doesn't matter. Cross tuned or straight yeah, standard? Yeah, yeah. And I'll, I'll show you. How many of you are using cross tuned? Okay. All right. So the majority of you are using standard, right? Okay. All right. Let me show the let me show the cross key people first. All right. And and actually, which break string? All right. If you're using uh, synthetic gut strings don't don't tune up just stay in standard they don't like going if you got steel strings they do fine uh, all, right. all right so if you're in cross key a actually and for the others too that the top two strings are the same so it doesn't matter right for those of you in standard too all right here's version one all right it's notier and a little lilt here right I'll play it up to speed first so you can hear what we're aiming at, and then I'll slow it down, okay?
okay? Now if we slow that down, just keep that group. Don't worry about the notes. You can add the notes later. You could do, right? Can you find these on the strings or do you need me to tell you which notes? You just start with your third. Then you go over to the A string. Alright. How many of you know this tune in your head to hum? Yeah, it's hard to learn a tune that you can't hum. I just talked about that. Huh? Yeah, I know, but again, if, if you don't know what you're aiming at, it's really hard to hit the target. Alright. Yeah, that's it. That's all it is. You're not going to learn this right now, but you know you can get some ideas and go home and work with it. Okay? Now, here's the um, here's the Ashby version, and it fits with that. Okay? I mean, it's just got a different rhythmic focus, right? All you're doing is bowing between the E string and the A string. Keep your finger, keep your middle finger on the second position there. You know, on your second note on, on the A string and then you go and you bounce it off right you can see what I'm doing here that's all it's real simple but you start with that groove and then you can move out to the other stuff, right? Keep doing that. version in cross key, but it shouldn't be too hard. Let me think, see it for a second. that you'll need to play that A chord 
that's like where you use your first finger hitting simultaneously the G string and the D string, right? And the only real difference is that he doesn't go back up for that. You know, but you could do that. Okay, now, for me, when I, you know, if I'm at something like this, the best thing I can get out of it is just things to go home and work on. You know what I mean? And that's what I'm trying to do for you. I don't expect us to walk out of here and be able to really put on a concert for them, you know. Um, you see what I'm saying? Do you have questions about any of the things that I'm talking about here? I know I'm going pretty quick, but I'm trying to cover as much ground as I can. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I am like a cyber idiot. So all this new stuff, I really don't know how to use it. If I, ha if I knew how to use it, I'd probably use it, you know? Um, when I'm learning a tune, I tr like I say, I try and get in my head exactly what I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to get. And, and, and I start off playing it slow, but I always try and play with a groove. I always try and keep a rhythm. Even if it's way slowed down, I always try and start with the groove. You know, don't worry about the notes. The notes will come. And then I go back and I listen to it and I hear what I'm missing. And then I try and adjust. But if you keep the groove all the way through, you know, and so if you have something that'll slow it down, yeah, that would be, and especially those ones that don't change pitch, you know, that would be, that'd be a great tool, yeah. Um, but if we were going to play a tune together, I mean, I want to stay with, you know, the, what I told you, it's crazy to play a tune that you don't know how to hum. So, like, let's pick a tune that everybody knows. Like, does everybody know some version of old Joe Clark? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay. Because, again, um, some of you are in standard and some of you are in cross key. I play Tommy Gerald's version mostly out of, out of cross key A. Okay? So, let me play it for you. And then we'll see what we need to do to uh, make it work all together, okay? Because really, that's the way I'd learn. I would listen to somebody like Tommy play. If you're in cross tune, can you play with just any old time band? Or do they have like, retune to cross A? No, I mean, if it's an A, it's an A, you know? It doesn't matter whether what key, I, what tuning I'm using, as long as it's an A, the banjo and the guitar are still playing an A. Yeah. yeah. Um, but all I would do is like sit down and listen to him do it, and then I'd go, like, you know, after I'd, I'd been away and trying to fool with it for a while, when I came back, I'd go, like, how do you, what do you do on that part right there? And then he'd sit down and he'd play it again, and I'd sort of try and figure, oh, wow, you know? I don't know. So it's way better, you know, it's great if you have tools where you can, like, you know, you don't have to drive for an hour and a half to go ask somebody a question how that goes. Because <laughs> he never had a phone. <laughs> okay, so th this is uh, my way of playing old Joe Clark. It, it's mostly from Time of Gerald, but I think I've probably put in other things. just like uh, let's play it at about that speed and try and keep the groove all right I'll give you tater so we all start in the same spot
Okay, now just while playing that, I was thinking of a couple things. Like again, with these regional differences, if you're playing a Kentucky version of this, you probably, went, if you're in a spot where you're going, oh, what's going on there? You probably are going to find it with your left hand. But like with Round Peak style and Tommy's style, I remember like on a tune like that going, I'd be watching his left hand and I'd go, you're like not moving that finger, those fingers as many notes as there are. Like, how's that happening? You know? Because I was thinking, you know, this is where you make the notes, right? And he goes, no, you make them notes with your bow. And I was going, huh? You know? Okay. And here in this tune is a great example of it. Okay. When you get to that low part, okay. You all play for me the low part of it. Like, uh, oh, fare thee well, old Joe Clark, fare that part, okay? One, two, three, four. time and it was all the notes there okay now but what I was doing uh, again variations I don't play it exactly the same way every time right but like like what my left hand's not right That's, you know, that's a typical Tommy Gerald bow rock, it's called. You know, it's not in every kind of Appalachian fiddling, it's just in that particular thing. But each regional variation's style has little cool stuff like that, you know. And so that's all I'm saying is to encourage you to go around and listen to those old recordings. A lot of times when I teach at these camps, the students will go, Oh, well, you know, I like listening to Bruce Mulski and you and guys of your generation because it's too scratchy, those old guys. <laughs> going like, but they're doing stuff like that's just like one sweep through. Uh, you know, our, what we heard is only one appreciation of it. And we all go back and play, I guarantee we play things differently than we did, you know, the first time we, we heard it. Like, go back to those old guys. Listen to it. There's, it's unbelievable. There was a different way of seeing the universe in those days and it's reflected in the in the music and it's 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 a tonic believe me for the soul it is go back to it it's if you want to be an old-time fiddler do that I, that's all, that's my prescription okay so let's go ahead and play this again some more here and if there are some of you who are like kind of at a more advanced level and you've been working on something and you and you you know just want you know uh, a little help with that 
speak up now because I've been, you know, trying to cover the whole spectrum here. No? When you you drone, right? That's you pull. They tell me I drone on and on and on. <laughs> so when you you do a down bow when you drone and then you do your other it melody depends. line. It depends on where it lands in the rhythmic scheme, you know. I mean, uh Okay, um, let me think here. Alright, right, here's a tune uh, called Brushy Forks of Johns Creek. Uh, I, my version is kind of a mix between Hiram Stamper's and uh, Ed Haley's, so, but there's several versions of this, okay? But she's asked for the drone thing, so I, I, I'm trying to see I something that uses. Anybody else has something more important? What's more important than Brushy Forks of Johns Creek? You know? <laughs> what you call a drone because like while I'm you know I'm droning on that string there the whole time there and the bow's going both you know what I'm saying all a drone is is like you know a harmony uh, but but like a pedal note like like on a bagpipe it would be you know the one you don't change it's just now you can change them and that gets a little more complicated and it's fun to do but in the beginning you know you just sort of stay with almost like what those uh, chanter what, what, the, what do they call them, drones. you know, on the bagpipe? The drones, drones. yeah, the drone, yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it just stays there against it's the just, other. Yeah, it just makes it so nice. Well, for, for those kind of tunes, it does, you know. Do you but, have your bridge flattened? Well, yeah, um, you know, like uh, classical players and a lot of Irish players, too. But I noticed the Cape Breton fiddlers do like we do. But, uh, yeah, I have trouble, like, if I'm playing a round bridge, trying to get, I'm not used to, like, getting way over there for the E string, you know. But, I mean, you know, the reason people do the round bridge is so that they can make sure they only play one at a time, one at a time. Yes, ma'am. I wanted to ask about your bowing. Uh, when you were teaching us, and even when you were doing Old Joe Clark, I was trying to, figure out how you were bowing, and I just, I gave up. It, it wasn't, no, it wasn't consistently. It, sh it wasn't consistently <laughs> shuffle. It was shuffle with changing it when you needed to get a certain. Sound. All right. Now you know there are people who are like more organized thinkers than I am. You know, <laughs> who are no seriously who see patterns in that way. Like I'll tell you, Brad Leftwich yeah, has Brad been the most Brad amazing at like taking apart yes. what Tommy did and what some other fiddlers did. I just never approached it that way. I mean, I, I wish I could. I appreciate it. I think it's great what he's done, you know. And I think it's a really good teaching tool for a certain, what, for people that think a certain way. 
But for me, it's always been like I hear the thing and I want to go, how do I do that? Well, that's, that's where I'm coming from. I was yeah. listening to you and saying, how do I do that? Well, I know. Yeah, and I'm, so I'm it's like I down. never think in terms of shuffle. You know? you know, I never really think of that. And, you know, some it's the same thing as like in my harmony singing, right? Uh, you know, I used to do, uh, my main thing was a harmony duet act with my ex-wife, right? And people go, oh, man, that, like, the, that thing you do there, and they give it a name, you know? Like, that, that, that suspended thing you, you do there, that sus four you're doing, I'm going, is that what I'm doing? You know, I just hear what I want it to sound like, and then I do it. And, yeah, there are names for all these things. If you're, you know, systematic thinker, there are, like, somebody even got Tommy to use a, a light thing. Does anybody know about that? And kind of traced it. Oh, yeah. yeah. So there's all kinds of, like, you know, it, there are people who have definitely tried to, to, to make this more accessible in that kind of systematic way. It's just not what I'm good at. I just sort of go, like, which tune were you thinking about? The old Joe Clark? Yeah. Well, Tommy does use a little, there's a little thing that's just so characteristic of his shuffle and, and then, the, you, know, you know, what you called the bow rock, which is what he called it too. And that's just particular to his style. Now, because I learned so much from him, I probably use it in other tunes as well. But, you know, like, I don't know, yeah. So yes. show us the shuffle in the rock. Well, yeah, yeah, do it real slow so we can see what's going on. Okay. I'm just starting off. Are you going to tap your foot like this? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, you know? Yeah. I mean, so, like, yeah. How about well, what happens? Okay, and again, this, I am not a bow Nazi. I mean, because I've seen good fiddlers who are all over the map with it. But it is true, you know, that if you're, you know, like, Brad Liftwich is the most beautiful bowing, you know, and he's very systematic with it, okay? Um, a general rule, I would say, is like, if you end your phrase on an up bow, you know, you're ready for the down bow to begin the next phrase. But again, it's a general rule. It's not like, you know, like, oh my gosh, I just ended on a down bow, I'm starting on a bow, oh, I'm going to be punished, you know, it's not, it's not that way. If it works, you know, I mean, Albert Hash up bowed the heck out of it, and he was a dang good fiddler, you know. But yeah, no, it's just like, I remember when I first went to Tommy, I was pushing the bow, and I remember him saying to me, well, you, you'll make a fiddler if you quit pushing that bow. And I, I'm going like, what? What does that mean, pushing up? Doing like, instead of going, going, right, doing that, okay? And I remember going to Fred Cocker, I'm like a couple days later going like, and now Fred couldn't see real well at that point, he had cataracts. I said, Fred, Tom, Tom, Tommy says I'm pushing the bow. Like, he goes, well, hell, damn bow's got to go both ways, don't it? <laughs> and I said, well, that's what I thought, you know? But then I understood what he was talking about. Like, later on, is like I'm trying to get a phrase that he does, like an old bunch of keys. I'm going, there's no way you can do that if you're hitting an up bow on your downbeat. It just, you're just no way you'll be tangled up in knots. So it's basically, it's the simplification. But it's, think of it like tapping your foot. You go down, it's gravity, you know? But then the funny thing, and I, I put this in that play to this whole conversation, because then, it, you know, Tommy did his, those little bow triplets with an upstroke. So one day I'd say to him, like, I, I, said, I said, well, what about that? And he goes, well, hell, that's just taking up the slack. The damn bow's got to go both ways. <laughs> <laughs> So, so what? What did somebody just asked me to do something? Just this. Just do it. Do it real slow. In the old Joe Clark. Yeah. Okay. I don't know what's that. That's a bow rock to me, or a shuffle, whatever. And more.
again, it's just keeping that groove primary. I mean, that's that's the way I hear it. Rather than going, oh, am I doing upper? You know, if you keep that groove primary, it'll all sort out. It really will. It'll 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 come together. Any anything else you all want to hear or or play or try? Yes, ma'am. Uh, that's a retune job. Okay. Um, I'll tell you what, if there's nothing else, I'll, I'll go to it, because there's some great tunes in that tuning. Oh, what I'm talking about, it's, it, Sally Ann, I can do, okay. Um, she's asking for a tune that Tommy learned from a black musician, uh, a guy who played it on the guitar and sang it. Uh, another tune that he learned from a black musician, Bo Weevil. Both of those he took home and he put in this tuning that is an old Scottish tuning with three D strings, like lots of drones. He calls it dead man's tuning, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because what uh, they used it for Bonaparte's retreat mm -hmm. and other bagpipe tunes. Mm -hmm. But I thought it was cool he used that tuning for uh, these blues tunes, and they work great. So what do you mean? All right, well, I guess I'm going to have to do this. Oh, That's all right. That's all right. That's what we're here for, okay? So I'm in standard now, right? All right, I'm going to drop my G string to a D, an octave below the regular D. Right. There you go. And I'm dropping the E string to a D. So I've got D, D, A, D. That's it. Something's got it. Everything else is a D. All right. Cool. D, D, A, D. Now, this is pretty widespread. I mean, like, Tommy played a version of Bone Parts for Cheat, but the one most people are familiar with. Bill Steps from Kentucky, the one that they that Aaron Copeland used in Rodeo. Okay. okay. So, like, the, just to s see what this tuning can do. When I'm going to use this tuning, I usually just bring a fiddle in this tuning because those strings don't like being moved that much. They yeah. keep moving. Especially if you got the gut or synthetic gut. They have like memory. That's the kind of tunes that this is usually used for. So that was his Bonaparte. That's Bill Stepp's Bonaparte's. Okay. Tommy played a slightly different version, but that's the one most people are familiar with because it's the most famous. But I just wanted to show you, you know, because that's pretty, you know, Celtic sounding and standard. And then he takes these blues tunes, if I can ever get this in tune. And so like Bo Weevil, he heard a, a, a woman singing this with just a tambourine. And he was so amazed by her singing, he said it made the hair stand up on his head. He and his brother spent all their money to go back and hear her sing this like every performance she did that day. And he was about 17 years old, he said. And then he goes back home and he uses this tuning to do, to do this.
Oh, we were told the farmer better treat me right. Heat up all your cotton, sleep in your grain bed tonight. Told the farmer, don't need no forward machine. Heat up all your cotton cane, buy no gasoline. You know, and it goes on and on. But you can hear how spooky it is. It's very cool, right? And then you asked for the Ryland Spencer. Well, he heard that when his family moved into town and he's laying in bed and he hears this guy come by in a wagon playing it on the guitar like at four o'clock in the morning and again he takes this tune and now people have made this into a band tune and do it in different tunings and keys but uh, he this is more or less the way he used to do it my voice from last night. <coughs> oh, Riley Spencer done gone dry. There ain't no more whiskey in this town. No, there ain't no more whiskey in this town. Trump down the flowers all round my grave, the rising blue again. Yes, the rising blue There's a version of that on, on my Memory Theater CD that I made with John Doyle, with Dave Grant just doing incredible bass stuff on it. We got a hip-hop drummer to play on it, too. It's very cool. I figured to bring it back around full circle. But, uh, so what you just did, did you, did you play off that A string most of your melody? Yeah, well, well, I'll tell you, you can do other stuff. Here's a, here's a fiddle tune I wrote in this tuning, and you'd be surprised how many notes you can get with just, just you know, with the D and an A, but... in there, you know, yeah. even we just, you know, Jim and Arnold, named after two of my neighbors. All right, well, I believe <laughs> I've run most of you off by now. So, okay, thanks. <laughs> Come to the concert and the dance tonight.